Philippians chapter 2. I guess what prompted this is that uh, um, I look around and see what people are doing, uh, the philosophies that they have, the principles that they live by, uh, the conclusions that they make. And maybe I should be more kind than this, but in, in my way of looking at it, I'm wondering what they're thinking. Uh, it just doesn't make any sense what, what's going on. Uh, I mean, to the point of, um, it, not that it just doesn't make sense. I mean, it's, it's just how can you even come to that conclusion? It's so ridiculous. Well, the problem is that they do not have uh, a right mind if they're not saved to begin with. Uh, they can't have a right mind. And those of us that are saved uh, can get caught up in other things as well, uh, but we have to have a right mind. And I want, to, I want us to look at that this morning, and uh, I've just kind of entitled this, Thinking Like Jesus Thinks. Uh, in Philippians chapter 2, I want you to look at verse 5, if you would. The Bible says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now to lay a little bit of background here, when the, when the verse, verse 5 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Please understand that you don't have God's mind from the standpoint of his intellect, his knowledge, his abilities, all those things. You don't have that or never will. But when it says, let this mind be in you, what God wants us to do is think like he thinks. Now, the Bible tells us in Isaiah that his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. We're not going to get it all. We're not going to grasp it all. But we can grasp what God wants us to grasp. He wants us to have a mind in the way we think that will change the way we live and will uh, cause us to live a life that honors God. The world can't do that. The Bible says the natural man understandeth not the things of God. Why? Because they are spiritually discerned and a lost man has no spiritual discernment. Now they might come to their own conclusions about things and they might even get it right every once in a while. Uh, I, I posted something this week and and talked about that uh, when it snowed, uh, Nancy told me that she was looking it up on her phone, that it was supposed to start at a certain time and end at a certain time, and I noticed that it pretty much did that. They got it right. <laughs> and so when I posted that, I said, but I believe they use this principle. A battery with no cl uh, a, a clock with no battery in it is right twice a day. Every once in a while they get it. Okay? Every once in a while, I, I've read, don't read very much of it, but I've read of some philosophers that don't know God at all, that every once in a while they get something right. right? But it's by accident. It's not by, you know, the, the, their discernment. All right? So, uh, we need to have a proper discernment about things. We need to have the mind of Christ, let the, this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We need to think like he thinks. And we can do that. This passage of Scripture, in the context of this, and this is really what we're going to be looking at is the context of verse 5 through 8, is that when we see the way Jesus thought, then we can see what Jesus did, why he did it. Now, if that's the kind of mind that God wants us to have, then we should be, and I'm, I'm going to use this word in its proper context, and, and uh, uh, that means we're going to act like Christians. We're going to be Christ-like. 
When this mind is in you, when you're thinking that way, you're going to act the way God would have you to act. And people can see that. Uh, as the world gets crazier and crazier, and it is, we should stick out more. That we're not following that. That we're not buying into that. That uh, we're not uh, um, tolerating that. Okay? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 16, For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Now as I read that verse, uh, how is it possible to know the wisdom and intellect of the all-knowing God? Well, he is omniscient. There's nothing that God doesn't know. Well, we can't obtain to that. We're not going to obtain to that. There are certain uh, uh, religions that believe eventually we become gods. Well, that's not in the Bible. But they say you, you eventually you become that. I don't know what process you have to go through. I don't know how many lives you have to go through. I don't know what they believe in all of that. But if they can make up that part, they can make up the rest of it. But this says, For who hath known the mind of the Lord? And if I'm supposed to have the mind of the Lord, and the Bible says I can't know the mind of the Lord, that sounds like a contradiction. That sounds like a, a thing I can't, I can't do. But that's because people are not defining and understanding what's being said. In, in 1 Corinthians 2.16, For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? Very simple. Who's smarter than God? Who is able to point the finger at God and said, You didn't do that right. You should have done it this way. Now, when I put it in that context, all of us would say, Oh, nobody would ever say that. I want you to know people say it all the time. Because they don't agree with God. They say, well, I wouldn't have done it that way. Well, be glad you, you did. Be glad you're not in charge. Because we make a mess of everything we do. And God does all things well. Now, whether we understand exactly how it's working, uh, I mean, I, I've seen things that, that worked out over a period of a long time. Well, I, I'm just going to give you mine. This is my own personal example. And I, I've told you this before. 24 years ago, I wanted to do what I'm doing right now. I, I wanted to get a Bible Institute started. I wanted to, to get it into the islands. 24 years ago. 24 years ago, I was younger. I thought better able to do something like that. And God said, no. Not now. Not yet. And here we are now, older, I start to say old, and some days I feel that way, but older. And I almost question, why now? Why not then? Well, you know what? I don't have the mind of God on that, do I? Because God did what he did when he did it. And there's a reason behind all of that. And I may not understand that until I get to heaven. But in this verse, 1 Corinthians 2.16, For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. It's not talking about we have all the knowledge that God has. And uh, for lack of a better way of putting it, this kind of helps to bring it down to our level to understand it. We don't have God's brain. All right? Now, God's spirit, the Bible clearly tells us that. And I, I don't know how, how God is made up, but God's God, and God knows everything. And so as we're looking at this, we don't have God's brain. But we do have God's Spirit if we're saved. And we can have the mind of Christ. We can think like God wants us to think. He, is, he, is, uh, he enables us as His children to be able to do that. Uh, so, I mean, no, nobody has the mind of the Lord, and who can tell him anything? Who can instruct him in anything? But the verse does say in 1 Corinthians 2.16 that we have the mind of Christ. First of all, 
You can't have the mind of Christ without being born again. Second of all, to have the mind of Christ does not mean that you know everything He knows. However, we can think like He thinks. We can come to a proper conclusion on matters that we deal with in this life. How are you handling your situations? You need the mind of Christ. You need to think like He thinks. Uh, one of the worst statements that could ever come out of somebody's mouth is, I've got this. I can handle this. I can take care of this. And when we, when we get that kind of mindset, first of all, we don't have the mind of Christ. You study the life of Christ. He relied upon the Father. He's, he was God, he's God now. And He relied upon the Father. He was showing us what it means to have the mind of Christ. Uh, in Philippians chapter 2, when it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. It's telling us that we can come to the right conclusions of how we should do what we should do, how we should be the way we should be. Right, that's the mind of Christ. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8, uh, this is my uh, former pastor's wife's favorite verse. It says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. So what are you thinking about? I mean, I, we can pretty much tell what you're thinking about. Anybody can. All they got to do is listen to you talk. That's what's on your mind. If, it's, uh, uh, if politics are on your mind, that's what you're going to talk about. Uh, if, the, uh, uh, if the latest crazy thing to come out of Washington is what's on your mind, that's what you're going to talk about. If Jesus is on your mind, that's what you're going to talk about. It's whatever's there is what's going to come out. But this verse says we're supposed to be thinking about these things. These things. What are the true things, honest things, just, pure, lovely, good report, virtuous, praiseworthy should be the things that occupy our mind. The Bible clearly tells us to think on these things. If the Bible tells us to have the mind of Christ, now let me put this together, and the same Bible tells us to think on these things, do you realize this is what Christ is thinking about? Now get that. Does God know all about the negative? Why, sure He does. Are there times when some of those things must be addressed? Absolutely. Jesus did that. When the Pharisees would come along with their self-made religion, He dealt with it. He, he talked to that, And that is a negative thing that was going on. And yes, He dealt with that. But why would He do that? There was a true, honest, just, pure, lovely, good report, virtuous, praiseworthy reason behind it. Because he wanted to see them change. He wanted to see them get it right. He wanted them to be saved. He wanted them to be a part of the family of God. He wanted all of that. And so that, those are the things that Christ thinks about, and those are the things that we think about. We can easily get caught up in negativity to the point where we just become an old bitter sourpuss. I mean, you ever like to be around an old bitter sourpuss? They just get on your nerves, don't they? That was negative, what I just said. I just thought I'd tell you. But that's, that's, that's not the way we're supposed to be. Why did they flock to Jesus? Oh, there were those that, that hated him. That's true. But why did the multitudes flock to him? Well, it was because of what they could get out of him. That was true for some of them. Absolutely. But there were those who said, no man spake like this man. 
There's, he, has, he has authority. We haven't seen anything like this. We haven't seen anybody uh, uh, approach religion the way he did it. Now, that, that would be their view from the outside looking in. And the mind of Christ was lived out in his actions. And we can focus on what's wrong instead of what's right if we want to. When we do that, we become fault finders rather than edifiers. By the way, you don't really have... People are working way too hard. You don't have to work very fa hard to find fault in people. we got plenty of them. Yeah. But what are we supposed to be doing that? Are we supposed to be trying to find the fault or trying to encourage them and help them to overcome it? What's the difference? The mind of Christ. Christ came into the world to seek and to save that which was lost. I mean, we're condemned already. He came to save us. That was his mind. Uh, we're tearing down people rather than building them up. We're hurting them rather than helping them when we don't have the mind of Christ. Instead of the world uh, seeing the mind of Christ manifested in our lives, if we don't have the mind of Christ, then they'll see something that they don't want to have a part of. Be kind, tenderhearted. That's the mind of Christ. Be a help. So, what kind of mind, the question is this morning, what kind of mind do we have? Or maybe I should say, what kind of mind should we have? The mind of Christ. Go back to Philippians chapter 2. Now, in the, I want you to notice something. that This is always important to me. Uh, whenever I'm, I'm studying the Bible... I, you've heard our, our pastor make this statement, and, and I've heard others make it as well. And, and, it's, and it's very true. If you're going to study the Bible, always put what's there in context. Always. Uh, I mean, it's amazing what you can pull out of context and make it say something it doesn't say. I mean, I, I'm sure you probably heard the illustration about uh, uh, the illustration in the, in the book of Acts, I believe it is, where they were in, in the ship and there was a storm and all that kind of thing. Uh, and, and the Bible says we just let loose and let her drive. We're not talking about women drivers. It says just let loose and let her drive. You know what it says later? And all hope that we would be saved was lost. So I'll tell you what, I'll take that verse and I'll take this verse and I'll put those two verses together and, and I can prove to you that women should never drive cars. See? No. No. It always has to be in context. Always has to be in context. All right. I mean that as I, you know. I mean that as a joke. I hope you do. Uh, because my philosophy of driving is get out of my way. So, all right. Now, in the context, if you'll notice, verse five, six, seven, and eight are all one sentence. One sentence. This is one thought. It has many parts to it, but it's one thought. It begins with, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And how did this mind of Christ manifest itself? That's verses 6, 7, and 8. who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now, we need to have the mind of Christ. And we can learn something from verses 6, 7, and 8 as to how that mind manifested itself to the world. It said in verse 6, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. To be in the form of God is to be robed in all His majesty, in all His splendor, sitting on the throne in heaven, sovereign over the universe. He thought it not robbery to be in that position. Why not? Because He's God. Now, this is not a statement of arrogance. It's a statement of fact. It is who He is. 
uh, I, I've discovered uh, um, a TV channel. I like it. INSP. That's a, they have westerns on there. I like westerns. Uh, I grew up with all these shows that y'all think are really, really old. I remember when they were new. I'm an antique. That's the reason I can do that. But I used to watch all those shows. I could tell you about Cheyenne and Sugarfoot and, you know, all those. Uh, wanted, Dead or Alive and Have Gun, Will Travel and all those things. You know. Well, there was a, this was a little bit later on, but there was a TV show that came out. It was called The Guns of Will Sonnet. Wasn't on very long. And a Walter Brennan was in that show. And he and his grandson were trying to find the boy's daddy and his son. That was Will Sonnet. They were looking for him. And whenever they would go, they had the reputation of being the fastest guns in the West, all three of them. And when somebody would ask him the question, this would be uh, Walter Brennan's uh, statement in the show, he said, no brag, just fact. He said, no brag, just fact. Jesus is not bragging. This is not a, bra a braggadocious statement at all. What he's saying is, I'm God, and being in the form of God, it was not robbery for me to be equal with God. I didn't steal anything from God because I am God. Amen. Before, Jesus, before Abraham was, he said, I am. He's God. All right? When he, when he was in the form of God, it is to be sitting on the throne in heaven and worshiped by the angels. It's to be in his rightful place as God. In other words, what he's saying is, this is the truth. This is a true statement. If you have the mind of Christ, you're not going to be afraid of the truth. You're not, you're, you're not going to say, well, maybe I shouldn't give the truth about this because they, they might get the wrong idea. No, the truth will always withstand scrutiny. Go ahead and be truthful. The truth is, Jesus Christ is God. And he said, when I was in that form, in other words, before I came here, that's who I am. Not, not, not who I was. That's who I am. You know. He is the I am God, by the way. All right. Uh, to be in that position. So what he's really saying in verse 6, I'm telling you my position. To be in that position is not stealing any glory from God, which is the word robbery, for Jesus Christ is God. To be equal means that he is not any more or less God. He's God. All right? Now, if we apply that thinking to us, we're not supposed to think we're God. But we are supposed to think about the truth of who we are. Who are you? I'm not asking your name. I'm asking your position. That's what Jesus was talking about, the position that he had. I'm God. Your position is, if you're saved, you're a child of God. Don't be ashamed of that. That's the truth. You, you've been... In your position, you've been made joint heirs with Christ. In your position, you're a part of the family of God. That's your position. Uh, don't downplay that truth. I know we're undeserving of it. I get that. I get that. Uh, but we're children of the King. We've been washed in the blood of Jesus. We should think about our position, not so we become puffed up and proud, but so that we can rejoice in what Jesus Christ has done for us, placing us in His family. We're talking about acknowledging the truth. We ought to be about truth. The mind of Christ is about truth. My position this morning, if you're saved, you have the same position. My position is, I am seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, according to Ephesians 2 6. Amen. I tried to, it, it, and, and it, it had actually worked. When I, I was teaching Sunday school class many, many years ago, and uh, my mom and dad were both in that class. It's kind of interesting when you're teaching your parents. I was my parents' pastor for a while. How about that? But. 
uh, I, I was teaching uh, from Romans chapter 8, and my dad, in his upbringing, I, I, I have no question whatsoever that my dad was a saved man, my mom a saved woman. I had no doubt about that. But uh, you have to be careful what you're taught. And one of the things that my dad struggled with was eternal security. And the reason he struggled with it was not because of he, didn't, he didn't believe God was who he was and Christ did what he did. He said, I just, I just have a hard time that I can go out here you know, and act like an idiot one day, and I still am saved. He said, I, just have, I have a struggle with that. And so I was teaching on that, that morning from Romans chapter 8, where it says, those that he justified, he sanctified, and those that he sanctified, he glorified. Now, he hath glorified. Now, that term means past tense. It's already happened. So, if he, I, I would ask him the question, I said, have you been saved? He said, well, yes. All right, then that means he justified you. Is that right? He said, well, yes. Well, that means he set you apart for, for him. Is that right? He said, well, yes. And he said, he's already told you. He's glor already glorified you. That means you're already seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And it's a, it's a done deal. It's going to happen. It just hasn't happened physically yet. That's the only difference. But in the mind of God, it's already happened. Already glorified. If you're already glorified, Sound like to me you're pretty eternally secure. I, I liked what I've, I've heard since I've been here when they would talk about that, uh, what John saw, the revelation that he saw. Isn't that interesting? He already saw himself in heaven. Yeah. That's pretty good. Amen. Well, God's already seen us that way. Yeah. All right? And if God's already seen us that way, that settles that. Yeah. All right? So, uh, I'm already seated. And if you're saved, you're already seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I'm in the Father's hand, the Bible says. In John 10, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I will give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. The absolute truth is I cannot be lost again. I cannot. I have eternal life. That's a truth. You don't have to get all, you know, stick your chest out about all that because you didn't have nothing to do with it. Christ did it all. But it's a true fact that that's who you are. That's the position that you have right now. And so when, when Jesus said, it's not robbery for me to be equal with God, that's not bragging. He was stating the fact of who he is. And you ought not be ashamed to stand up and say, well, I'm a Christian. Well, make sure you act like it. But I'm a Christian. Right? It also, uh, we're also a child of the king. How about that? Amen. You are a chosen generation. A royal priesthood. Sure. And holy nation. A peculiar people. We don't have any problem with that one, do we? And we get that. Amen. No, that means different. Doesn't mean weird. It means yeah. different. Now, we're weird to the world because we're peculiar. All right? A peculiar people. Uh, that we should show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. We should think about who we are in Christ. That should be the mind that we have. Amen. Don't forget who you are. Don't forget who you are. All right, now, that was the position. Now, verses 7 and 8 talk about the purpose that Christ had. Right? This is the mind that he had, and the, and the way he thinks manifests the way he lived and what he did. All right? That's the same way with us. As a man thinketh, so is he. Yes. Amen. Right? Verse 7 and verse 8. After he said, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, that's his position, here's his purpose but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross. In these verses we find that Jesus Christ had his mind 
on the purpose of why he came. I'll ask you this. Why are you here? What's your purpose? Not just for today. What is your purpose for still being here in this world? That should be something that's in our mind. When it says that he was of no reputation, it's the thought of laying aside your position that you might put yourself in the place of service. Jesus had to come from heaven to do what he did. Sure. Now, I, you, you have to understand that you are who you are in Christ and all the benefits and all that, that goes with that. But if that's what you dwell on, you're going to become a Pharisee. The Pharisee wanted to make sure everybody saw them for who they are. All the position. The position mattered more than the purpose. Now listen, you can't carry out the purpose unless you have the position. All right? Amen. But the position is a blessing but if you're not careful, you'll let that defeat your purpose. In other words, you'll be one of those Sunday morning when the Bible, you know, Christians where the Bible says, occupy till I come, doesn't mean to occupy a seat somewhere and do nothing. Yeah. He made himself of no reputation. It's important to realize that Jesus never stopped being God. Never. But he did put himself in a place so that he could effectually serve mankind. This is the mind we should have. Amen. We're children of the king, but our purpose here is to serve. Interesting. Well done, thou good and faithful child of God. Is that what the Bible says? Well done, thou good and faithful, born again, saved. What? No. Thou good and faithful servant. Yes, saved. Yes, born again. Yes, seated in heavenly places. Yes, heaven's my home. Yes, all of that's true. But I'm still here and you're still here to serve. That should be our purpose. And if you're going to have the mind of Christ, you'll make yourself of no reputation. Now, understand, we get kind of the wrong idea about that too. Right? Some people say reputations are what some people think about you. Well, in a right in some definitions, I guess that's the truth. But the reputation aspect of this is if you are not willing to kneel, if you're not willing to bow, if you're not willing to step down in order to serve, then you're not willing to make yourself of no reputation. You see, because it's not about you, it's about Him. It's even not about you, it's about them. Now get that. It's about them that need you to be what you need to be in their life. Uh, it's important to realize he never stopped being God, but he did come down to that position. You can't do without being who you must be. That's true. But if you're ever going to do something, you can never think you're too good to do it of no reputation. Uh, our purpose here is to serve. We can do that because we're saved, but our position is not something that is to be flaunted by a holier-than-thou attitude. By the way, it's disrespectful to our Savior, to our position, and to our calling if we're not willing to kneel and to bow and to set aside pride that we might have no reputation. And the Bible says that Jesus made himself of no reputation. That term literally means it was a willful choice 
It was not a forced action. His mind was to choose to serve. Uh, I guess this would be a good thing to, to, to realize that God doesn't need us. That God wants us. That's different. God was God before there was anything. So God doesn't need anything. But it was His heart's desire to create. And the Bible pretty much teaches that we're the crown of that creation. And we rebelled. We sinned. But even before the foundation of the world, God already had a plan. The lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. We know that didn't happen until Calvary, but it was already slain, just like I'm already in heaven. Amen. It was already in the mind of God. But he made a willful choice. Our service may be a duty and our responsibility, but if we're to have the mind of Christ, then we step up into the volunteer line willingly. I wonder if I've told you the story about the preacher leaving the church every Sunday morning. Have I told you that? Y'all look at me. No? Okay. Like I told you, after 40 years, everything kind of runs together in my head. Every morning after the Sunday morning service, when the invitation was given and it was over with, the preacher would take off out the side door, get in his car and leave. Happened week after week. And... Deacons got together and said, we've got to find out what's going on. So that Sunday morning, same thing happened. Invitation was over with. Preacher went out the door, got his car, took off. Well, the deacons went out the other door and got in their cars and followed him. They followed him to the train station. The preacher was standing there, beside the train, just jumping up and down, hollering, hallelujah, hallelujah, praise the Lord, hallelujah. About that time, one of the deacons tapped him on the shoulder, and he turned around and said, Oh, well, what are y'all doing here? He said, No, we're wondering what you're doing here. He said, Well, we've, we've, we've seen you do this every week. Why are you here? He said, It's real simple. He said, This is about the only place I can come to where I can see something pull off on its own accord without me having to push it and prod it. That train would go on its own and do what it's supposed to do instead of me having to beg. Amen. You see, it's a willing. It's willing. Are you willing? Do you have to be searched out when there's something to be done? Or are you just standing right there and say, well, here am I. Amen. He made himself yes. of no reputation. He chose that. I wonder if we're saying the same thing that says in Isaiah 6, 8, Here am I, send me. Acts 9, 6, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? I wonder if that's our... If we, if we have the mind of Christ, we'll be willing. Also, it says he took on the form of a servant. This is a mind that does not look down on the plight of people, but gets in a position to do something for them. Can I describe it in this manner? He robed himself in servant's clothes. In my way of seeing it, it's like putting on work clothes. Because there's a task at hand, and it's going to require some hard work. And I get up in the morning, my wife can tell kind of what I may be having in my mind that I'm going to do that day by what I put on. I put on the clothes I don't mind getting dirty, getting messed up. If I'm going to do something, that's going to mess them up. If we, if we had this mind, we'd realize we're here to serve. And service should be what we're about. And service is work. We should not view it any other way. kind of the idea of 
You know, we ought to be rolling up our sleeves and getting at it. I mean, that's our purpose for being here. So he took on the form of a servant. And then it says, and was made in the likeness of men and being fashioned as a man. Jesus identified with those he was serving. You know, I'm no longer lost. I'm no longer going to hell. But I am in a minority. Uh, I don't really want to remember too much about, about my past, but at the same time, I need to be reminded where he brought me from. Right. And we need to realize that most of the world, that's where they are. Sure. He was formed in fashion like a man. Jesus wasn't a sinner, but he identified with mankind. Amen. He felt their need. He felt their pain. He was compassionate. He experienced what it was to be a man. To be in their place and experience what they experienced. He did it yet without sin. Tempted in all points, like as we are, the Bible said. In other words, the devil threw everything at Jesus he could. Everything. Jesus understood what it took to deal with that. We need to... Let's, not, let's don't forget where Jesus brought us from. Don't forget that people need the Lord. Don't forget that people are lost and on their way to hell. They need to be served. They need to be helped. And that's what servants do. And then it says Jesus humbled himself. Even though this is God in flesh, he humbled himself so that he could do what needed to be done. This is the mind that we should have. In the mindset, in this type of mindset, I'll put my work clothes on, I'll get to the task, whatever it takes. I'll roll up my sleeves and get dirty if need be. The cause of Christ is not about me and what I get out of it. It's not about accolades or setting in high places, but becoming of low estate so you can be close enough to the work to do the work. They criticized Jesus because he sat with sinners. But he got close enough to the work so he could do the work. He didn't become one of them. I'm not going to drink to reach an alcoholic. <laughs> but I can, I can be un close enough to them that maybe I can help them. And then the Bible says that after he humbled himself, he became obedient. We're not good at that. Uh, but if you've got the mind of Christ, you don't have a problem with it. Obedience carries out the carries out the will of the Father. Obedience, or to obey, is to submit to the will of another. Obedience is not dictated to by the circumstances, but does what is right and necessary no matter what may come. I challenge you to find anywhere in the Bible where God ever compromised with anybody. And that's his mind. We should have the same mind. We're not compromising with the world to reach the world. But it sure is an, uh, an obvious thing that's going on right now. What happened when a quote-unquote church became a rock concert? Amen. What happened? Again, I'm going back to that. What are they thinking? Well, I know what they're thinking. This is what it's going to, to take to appeal to draw people. So the gospel's not good enough. Jesus isn't good enough. The truth isn't good enough. No. No, as a matter of fact, when we find out what Jesus did, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. When we find out what Jesus did... He did the only thing that would work. 
There wasn't this broad scope of things, of possibilities. No, there was only one thing that would work. And what was that? <clears throat> he was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Amen. That's the only thing that would work. That was it. His mind was set on fulfilling his purpose, knowing it would bring him suffering, and he sacrificed himself so he could accomplish his purpose. He held nothing back. He was all in. And, and the Bible says, with his face like a flint, he went to Calvary. Amen. True servants serve with all their heart. This is the mind of Christ. And it's the mind that we should have. Lord, what is it you want me to do? Lord, will you equip me, empower me, guide me, help me? For without you, I can do nothing. Lord, what, what, what is the purpose here? Let me get you to turn one place. For just a couple of minutes. I'm almost through. Turn to Romans chapter 12 for just a moment. I, just want you to, I know you're familiar with this, but I want you to see it. Put your eyes on it, as they say. Romans chapter 12. <clears throat> I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Jesus took upon himself the form of a servant. And what did he do? He offered himself as a living sacrifice for sin. He wants his mind to be our mind. Are we willing to present ourselves as a sacrifice before God? That means you give it all up and you give it all to Him. Every bit of it. When it said, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Did you get that? The renewing of your mind. What mind? The renewing of the mind of Christ in you. Right. Because this world keeps messing it up, keeps trying to dirty it up. Simple definition of renew, new again. That's what re means. New again. It's new again. That was represented by the washing of the feet, by the way. We get contaminated by the world. We need renewing. Amen. We need renewing. And prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The mind of Christ is the mind of one who has the authority and calling to serve the Father with all that he is, and that's the kind of mind we're supposed to have. It is a willing humility that obeys with a desire to see the work that is necessary to do done to the glory of God. So the Bible tells us, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. How about stopping? stop thinking for yourself? And start letting the mind of Christ guide you. Surrender yourself, submit yourself to Him so that we can be what God wants us to be here. Lord, thank You for this wonderful opportunity this morning. I pray that You would bless in a mighty and great way in the worship service to come. And Lord, may You draw us closer to You today. If there be one that does not know you, I pray that this would be the wonderful day that they trust you as their Savior. And Lord, for those of us that know you, may we be renewed in our mind day by day that we might have the mind of Christ. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.